Hello everybody and a very warm welcome along to another special live recording of The Good, The Bad and The Rugby! You are very, very welcome. We have got a full house this evening. We are once again in partnership with City Index, who are the leading provider of spread betting, CFD and FX trading. And for the third week in a row, we are down at the glitz and the glamour of the Prince in London. A cheer for the Prince in London, please, ladies and gentlemen, here in Fulham. And thanks to the good people at Red Bull, the Prince has been turned into the best seat in the house to watch all the autumn internationals this year. The official energy drink of the RFU have done a fantastic job and this is the place to be if you like your ruggers at the weekend. Um, it's a big, big time in the rugby calendar at the moment, and we have got three very big, big characters uh, to talk about it with us this evening. Mr. Mick O'Tindall is in the building, wearing a genuine parachute from 2000. You are once again back in your empty seat at the end. Um, oh, I don't feel well. Do you not? Actually, it's the first time I've got into a Draco shirt, so it actually feels quite it's, good on me. There's enough for the entire family. I know, so. literally, I remember him playing in this, and it was like it was a full-length shirt. Um, he was a little boy as well. Wasn't he? What, what I love about that is there are people who would pay hundreds of thousands of pounds for a genuine Brian O'Driscoll shirt, and you've had that sitting in the attic for 21 years. Yeah. This weekend, we'll wash the car First cap for both of us, 47.13. Fuck on that, Brian. All right. And we're off and running, ladies and, and gents. Uh, uh, ladies and gents, one of our absolute favourite guests, just a rock star, the boss that is, the former England captain, I think the most successful England captain of all time in almost any sport. Ladies and gents, please give it up for Dylan Hartley, who's in the building. Oh, we're getting serious. The coat is coming off. Brilliant. We, we could make it just a little tidy house if you want to. And the cap, it's all going wrong. Uh, last but not least, um, we have a, a guest with us. I mean, if you're building up to England, South Africa, the first meeting, of course, since the World Cup final in 2019, <coughs> uh, we have a man who is pretty much uh, ideal to discuss all that with us. He is a Springbok goat, if that's not few. All right, w welcome to the one, Safa. So, ladies and gents, it is the ledge that is. Mr. Brian Habana! <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, once again, you're very, very welcome. Chaps, so are you. I think, I think it's, it's actually even cozier than it was last week. <laughs> you said you're fitting into a Brian Driscoll top nine. It feels a little bit tight on the right-hand side, yeah? <laughs> Not fitting onto the sofa. Thank How God. are you? I'm going to come to you first. Have you come in from Paris for this? Oui, monsieur. J'étais là aujourd'hui pour le truc avec Land Rover. I mean, there was only one South African. I thought I'd at least get a French in this place. <laughs> Freaking hell. Doing what? Um, yeah, the Land Rover Rugby World Cup 2023. They've got a Defender of Tomorrow mascot system where we got the first little Frenchie that will be running out in the first game at Stade de France. Don't ask me the date. Um, and the new Range Rover hybrid, which Tins has already put on back order. <laughs> Bulletproof glass. And Sorry, I don't take hybrids. <laughs> Gas guzzlers. No, I don't. Uh, I am actually getting hybrid. Yeah, you have to. How did you know? They phase out in 2024, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome to Jaguar Land Rover. I didn't know they were going to be part of tonight's show, but lovely to have them with us as well. Brand ambassadors yeah, yeah, yeah. again. You did ask me. Yeah, I know I did. Been yeah, you can find everything in his link tree. It's <laughs> yeah, fine. Exactly. Comey, Comey, apparently, or, or Mexico.com. Sorry. What have you been up to? This seat shit. Right. <laughs> <laughs> The larger gentleman is struggling here. I mean, I need bottom above knees and hips, you know? Yeah, I'm so sorry. Is that what I... you said to your props as well? <laughs> no, come on. I'm, do, I'm just saying, I'm trying to get comfy. I'm trying to relax into this. Good. Quite oh. hot, the lights are bright. <laughs> right in your natural element. Yeah, I've got a body warmer on. My body's already yeah. warm. <laughs> like, what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> For some reason, I've got my top button undone, uh, done up. I'm going to undo that. There we go. Let's good. get comfy. I might even take my pants off on a second. Right. Whoa, 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 whoa. Here comes I'm another good. chin. I'm good. Thank you. We're here. Let's go. Let's go. We're off and running. What have you been... Between the two of you, I think you've got pretty much every gig in rugby media covered right now. Tins is obviously not doing a lot in rugby media. That's why he's shambling around with us two. <laughs> you, you were... You also get the email about the good, the bad in rugby. What email? To take over next year. No, uh, no, right. no. We're, no, we're no, on no, our way we, out. We, oh, we're actually... 
we, we are working on something, aren't we, GBR? We are. yeah. we got little... Something slightly more credible, though, for, for the new brand direction of Dylan Hartley. Yeah. Because we're rebuilding. Because the rugby ones and tatters... For, we are definitely searching for credibility uh, yeah. as well. Yeah. So if you yeah. can help us on that front... Guarantee, if you come on board this ship with Hask, it's always sinking, pal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. so, uh, Bring a bailer. Um, lots to talk about. And I want to start with you, first of all, because you are wearing an Irish shirt... And we mentioned at the start of the show that your love affair with Irish rugby has been non-existent. Could we have an update, please, well, off the back of the That's not entirely true. It's if you say it's something nice, true. no one reports about it. When you say that they're crap, a lot of people talk about it, and right. a lot of Irish people get you on podcasts to say why they're crap. And then when you tell them how, why they're crap, and then England go there, and someone said to me, none of this England team were getting that Irish team, and they beat them by 35 points, and I turned around very smugly that afternoon. Yeah, so, that was yeah. two years ago, though. I know. Three, but, four, four years. So this years is ago. why I say no one's done the in-between, where right. in the last two years they have changed the way they play a little bit. But I think uh, you saw it in the Six Nations and it was a continuance of that last week against Japan, but everyone was like, well, it was Japan. And you saw what they can... They're, they're, I think you're seeing the impact now of Farrell and Cat and a little bit of freedom at the reins. Uh, and they're enjoying themselves. You know, Lowe had a great game. Uh, it was, uh, you know, Kaylin Doris, you're also seeing some new players coming in that are actually really stamping their authority at the same time. And um, so I'm just pro good rugby, yeah? And when it's, so that's why I don't really like South Africa at the moment, but. <laughs> Sorry, we did score two yeah, ties yeah, against yeah, but, in the Rugby World Cup but, final. But that, <laughs> that's, that's what I'm saying. We'll come on to this, no doubt. Um, but I just like watching teams that I would pay, uh, buy a ticket to go watch and, you know, it's great to see Ireland back playing rugby that we want to watch. Can we have a cheer for Ireland in this room, please? Because the, we were both at, you were at Twickenham. You were on the. Are you not cheering for Ireland? Are you not, oh, are you, I thought you were looking at the. I thought it was to the crowd. Um, no. Well done, well, Ireland. Well done, Ireland. <laughs> Chuffed a bit for you. I. But that. But that's really interesting because we were at Twickenham on Saturday. I don't know if people were cheering in the room you were in, but in our in the room that I was in with Hask, England fans were genuinely pumped. To see, I'm not sure whether it was Ireland win or the All Blacks lose, but uh, you can cut it either way. Do, no, do because you... that's England fans. They support their home nations, so they're the only people who do that. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone else just hates England. Right. So it's <laughs> just the known, it's the known world. Yeah. We were just talking about there was a there's a pre there was a pre-season camp in 2003 in South Africa, which was basically horrible. They were kidnapped and they were made to live with barely no clothes on, and apparently they were dunked in like a freezing cold pool whilst God Save the Queen was playing. It's indoctrination <laughs> by other nations to hate the English at rugby. Um, but there you go. Yeah, we won't talk about the Mike Tyndall 13 shirt oh, on the tackle bags ahead of that World Cup has all. <laughs> it is, never went down, it, apparently. So, <laughs> it, it is strange, though, in, in terms of a psyche, isn't it? Like, I, I inherited this because I'm obviously a Kiwi. I, I grew up there wanting to be an all-black. Um, not quite good enough, limped my way over here. And I uh, found, uh, found myself in the main yeah, job. Yeah, I love England. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. Nice of a caps. Yeah, sign me up. Come you, on. Know, you know we're recording this, yeah, don't you? Yeah, we've been through this. Yeah. The backstory, <laughs> heritage, pride. It's all there. Family connections. It's all there. Trust me. It's it, with storytelling. Badinage. But like, I inherited this sort of hate of playing for England. I was a little bit confused. Playing and for England or playing... In, against England? for England, oh, okay. you know, you inherit everyone raising the game by 10, 15, oh, 20 percent just to beat England. You know, oh. they, they have a good season, especially up here in the Northern Hemisphere, if they beat England, regardless of any other game. But like when the All Blacks get beaten, it's not that. It's not the, the sort of, is the word Schadenfreude? Freud? Yes, Schadenfreude. Schadenfreude. Yeah, yeah. Schadenfreude. <laughs> um, yeah so I think it's German. It's German. Yeah. German. And but when you beat the All Blacks, it's, it's good for the game. It's good for the game. It's good for world rankings. It's good for everyone to have a shot at the, you know, it's good for to reset the table. It's just a, a different sort of psyche. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know what I'm saying. It's just a point. <laughs> yeah, I like it. <laughs> Crystal clear. Do you delight in the All Blacks losing? It's good for the game. It's just, <laughs> good for the game. It's just really good. To... And world rankings and... No, I think the, the All Blacks, the reason they probably one of the most successful teams globally and when a scalp is taken against them, it means that that team that did it is just exceptional on the day. Yeah. Um, and the, the reason is they're seen as one of the greatest in sports, not just in rugby. I think what they've achieved since the game's become professional, but even before that, the aura around the All Blacks is, is really good. So, yeah, it doesn't, I mean, for us, Springboks, obviously, it just buffers the, the one point um, you know, difference in the top of the rankings, which is yeah. not something we're going to complain about. It really is just England that everybody hates. 
Yeah, yeah, okay. for sure. We gave the world the game as well. It's like, have yeah. some respect. Where's the gratitude? Yeah. Where's the gratitude, eh? We gave you the ball. We picked the ball up and we ran with it. Quick trivia question. You know that England lost the first ever test match at Rayburn Place. Rayburn Place. I used to play that. Scotland. Yeah. Adam Brackies. Like, Adam Brackies, 1874. It was a dark day. Dark day. <laughs> Should we pay due credit to Ireland? What did you like? Who impressed you? Look, I... Look, I think at the moment in, in modern day rugby, you need a nine that can run and run powerfully from the base and actually bring forwards on whilst trying to make that... This defences now are just all about flying up. So if you've got a guy who can bounce out and hold that, hold those first two defenders, and then you might create a gap and your wingers can get... Uh, just peel off the off the back of them or you get inside balls which you'll see a lot now and I think Gibson Park on the weekend the way he lifts the tempo of the game the way he allowed his forwards to get on the front foot get big carries over the game line that was that is where games are won and lost and, and then and then your bats can get to finish off like low, loaded on the end but they've still got their defensive. You need a defence that can pressure, turn over ball. You know, you look at that last play of the game. Great read by Lowe and then Peter Omani. Mal! Drops straight over and, and does what he does best, you know. And, um, so you've got to give him credit. I think well, one to a man, they were up for it. And when you get Ireland up for it at home in the right situation, the way they face their hacker as well, you could just see that they, they wanted it. And, and they're very hard to beat when they're in that mood. Yeah. Did you watch it, or were you, you were obviously watched, busy doing no, it? No, yeah, I watched highlights. I was at Loch Lerman, um on Sunday, so I was trying to watch the highlights. <laughs> Did you watch it? I watched highlights. I watched it. <laughs> no, I didn't watch I highlights. I watched it in the greatest Another club trivia question. Bandiaki has never lost to the All Blacks in the Island shirt. I saw that stat on Instagram today. 3-0 for yeah. Bandiaki. Isn't that unbelievable? It's phenomenal. Th three wins in five for the, for the country. How many did I, you do? I had that at the start, yeah. Did you? How did yeah, it finish? Actually, yeah, 2004, it sort of went downhill a lot. Right. Uh, but for four years, I never lost to him, yeah. Take that. Uh, what I, I, forgot, I forgot the record after that. It was just yeah. forced it. <laughs> Redacted. Yeah, yeah. I never lost to Italy. <laughs> <laughs> or Japan. Honestly, the fear of that going into every game. <laughs> Being the first England captain to lose to Italy. It was like, fucking hell, boys, let's go. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to leave now. <laughs> oh, yeah. Did you, you had a couple, did you? Thanks. Yeah, did no, you thanks, Art. Did you play in the Italy loss? I did. It was my last test match for the Springboks. <laughs> I'm going to leave now. Thank you, everybody. It's been emotional. <laughs> oh, I'm wow. so sorry. Is that why you put me in the middle? Yeah, Thanks. it is. Okay, it perfect. Is. You had some one or two good days on the side. Um, what did you like? What did you make of Dublin and the occasion? And how good for the what, game? What did What did everyone make of of the fields of Athen Rye whilst the hacker was on? I don't see a problem with that. Neither do I. Didn't see it. So. <laughs> I've been very busy. Yeah. I, I work. But do you think, so uh, yeah. from your New Zealand heritage, uh, which obviously your English one was stronger, um, do, would you, as a ha is that, would it be seen in New Zealand as disrespectful if you're meeting a challenge with your own challenge with the fields of Athen Rye? Oh, I think culturally, obviously, understanding it at home, home advantage means you're going to get a, a stadium that supports your hacker. A hacker is a challenge, and they're on foreign lands. So, you know, being accept, uh, accepted or a challenge thrown down by the, the local people, the crowd, uh, I don't see a problem with it. And if anything, it probably drives more, more emotion, more, more motivation out of those players, I reckon. So I, I don't think that ever problem. There were a lot of good problem. nods at the end of it to each other, weren't there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I love that. Proper game on. Yeah. What, what, did you make of the, what did you make of the day, though? I think the day for me, what was brilliant was that both on attack and defence, Ireland were good. So yeah. normally when you beat the All Blacks, it's like either your defence is brilliant, you, you sort of get one or two lucky bounces. Where Ireland were brilliant was both on attack and defence, yeah. and they put New Zealand under pressure. And it showed elements of the game where New Zealand could be fallible, but it's very few and far between. And you think coming up against the French this weekend, it's going to be a very different All Black side. And I think just, you know, I mean, I think the number of tackles that Ireland made, but also the number of meters gained they made was much better than the All Blacks. So yeah. pretty impressive. I've got a question for you. When was the last time the All Blacks lost back to back? I was trying to work this out earlier. Well, this is your part of the show. You're supposed I, to know I, this I, stuff. I, I know. You're here for one reason. I know. What I'm going to do is I'm going to throw it up to the crowd. Springbox 2009. There's going to be a prize for the person who can Google it fuzz it. Yeah, is that we, what it was? We beat them three times that year. Oh, God. Well done. Well done, Brian. Well done, Brian, in the box. Sorry, I, but I had to get over Italy quickly. Yeah, I, th <laughs> but I, I think that is, that is going to be about right. Um, I, just, I think at the moment, though, that, you know, that sort of 
the, the sort of aura around that All Blacks team isn't... I don't think it should Why? be... No, I don't think it should be what, what people think it is. I think it's a completely different transition team that can be beaten. I think we know that how dangerous they can be and how... Uh, how the tries that they can score on the drop of a the drop of a hat are incredible and the skill sets but I think as a team at the moment they're not where they, they've been for the last 10 years because they've had a rebuilding process and you need people to keep cracking the nut and, and actually realise actually they're just a team that has, has skillful players in it but they haven't fully cohesed into the in, into the team that they had for 10 years cohesed is that a word it is now yeah, yeah thanks. Well, I, I, I like I, I suppose like most winningest yes uh, exactly it, it, on a serious point like this is probably a good thing for the All Blacks to, to happen like this is a growing point for them as a yeah. team and you'd rather and, and Ireland are, are very good at this at winning things a year out from a World Cup and then yes. you know <laughs> no well, what I'm saying is I'll, I'll let Mike Tindall go on that but what I'm saying is as, as a learning curve for them to to, to become that iconic team that is potentially going to be a World Cup contender. Yeah. They'll look back at this game and they're going to learn so much from that. And then can they bounce back from that this week? If they don't, it's just another sort of step on their journey to 2023, back in France, playing the same opposition. Like, they'll just use it as, as a sort of growth experience, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. I also, and I don't I, know what they're thinking, but I, that's what yeah. I'll do. I, I, I also think, think I don't know what everyone else thinks. I also think the actual state of international rugby is pretty good right now throughout yeah. a, lot, a lot of tier one nations. And obviously, we saw what Fiji almost did to Wales with, with 30 men for about 40 minutes. You can get them keeping the players on the field and... and a little bit more work. They could be. They 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 are X factor all over, and will always cause people trouble. I I actually you saw it in the Six Nations, one of the best Six Nations we've had, continued from last year. And I think I think we just have to appreciate that there are teams that can play right now. I think that French team's still going to take some beating because it's incredible. Yeah. It, it's mouth watering for this this yeah. Sunday or whatever it is. Yeah. How pleased are you for Andy Farrell? Because when you look at the head coaches up here, Eddie obviously gets a lot of headlines. Gregor gets quite a few. Wayne Pivac won a Grand Slam or won a Six Nations and therefore gets a few. But actually, Andy Farrell is going about his business very, very quietly in Ireland with Mike Catt and Simon Easterby. Obviously, you were playing under him with England years ago. Do you, what do you make of the job he's done with well, I think if you cast your mind, like rugby moves so quick and you're only as good as your last game of it. I remember like last year, yeah. there, there was calls for his head, yeah. you know, playing Johnny Sixth in and all this sort of stuff. And I, I like how he's a very strong-minded person. And I love it how he's still picking Johnny Sexton in his eyes must be his best fly half. You know what I mean? Yeah. So he's very, he's sticking to his guns and it's starting to bear fruit now, which is good. But a year ago, just like Wayne Pivak a year ago, like they were, they were getting shots fired at them for their opening sort of tournament. It takes time to transition. And we're talking about teams like the All Blacks. If you think Joe, Joe Smith was almost iconic with that Irish team for for five to I don't know how long but he was there for a good period of time yeah. Warren Gatlin iconic with yeah. his players there like those players need time to I suppose adjust and you can't come in as a coach and say well is it like it's like it's not revolution it's evolution you need time to to get players on side and get them believing in your way of doing things so Faz he's he's very hard northern edge I mean you look at Owen he's just a clone of his dad but he's a very sort of personable person as well um, and I'll tell you what, you just don't want to miss a tackle for him. One, because he inspires you, and two, shit scared of him. Really? <laughs> I, I mean, obviously, I wasn't, but... Uh, <laughs> no, but I mean, as a defensive coach, in my time with him, he would be on you. And, and I'm telling you now, as a defensive... When, when you've got a defensive set, you do not want to let your defensive coach down, the good ones anyway, if you care. Did, you, did he make his England debut alongside you? Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, we're heavy. Uh, I think we're heaviest centre pairing ever. I think at that point when we were both at sixty-two set, stone, seventeen stone each or something. Are you? Uh, d did you always see a coach within him? Yeah. Look, I think what leagueies generally bring is a, an energy that we don't get really in rugby union. It's like it's like. I, I don't know what it... They seem to talk more and more. The more tired they get, the more they talk, the more they G people up, the more they I mean, pick it's, people it's up. Not, it sounds like forwards. <laughs> it's not complicated talk, though. It's like, no, yeah, no, it's not. smash him! Yeah, yeah. yeah. smash him! It's just like decibels Anyone who on repeat. Where's a yeah, ref mic and just hears Faz go, get up, get up! That's it. It's inspirational. Um, but they're, but they, they, they love, like, off the field, playing gags on each other, winding each other up. Um, 
and I think it's infectious in some ways, you know, and, you know, you see it a little bit in Ashy, you see it obviously in Faz, and I, th I think people just sort of buy into that, and it, it's half the thing you need to be as a coach is you need the players to like you and, and want to play for you, yeah. and if you have that energy and you have that personal, personal side and personal connection, you know, if you listen to the pod and heard what, like, Alex Sanderson talks about in terms of level of, talk, uh, level of communication, they sort of get that they're humorous and personable at the same time and that sort of, yeah, I, that drags the fun side out of people Good on you Ireland How big a springboard is this for Ireland? Because Dylan was talking about the fact they're very good at winning things in between World Cups but did you see and do you see Ireland building a sustainable top level challenge running into 2023? Or I, is, I don't know that by the way I've just but actually, well, it's I, like I, a theme I've picked I, up on a theme from you guys I'm just I, I, read, I read exactly that somewhere else today. And I, I, I mean, you look at the age of Johnny Sexton, Jamison Gibson Park, you know, they're not, Peter Imani is, is sort of yeah. towards the twilight, except there's some really good players coming through. But do you see them able to sustain what they had on Saturday? I think it's going to be difficult to sustain that. I think coming off the high of beating the All Blacks and then trying to make that not revolutionary, but sustainable over a long period of time, where you've still got two Six Nations and end of year or Autumn Internationals in 2022. Two-year World Cup cycles is what every coach works for, but it's not what happens. I mean, we lost 49-0 against the Wallabies a year out from the World Cup in 2007, and everyone was asking for Jake's, Jake White's head. John Smith was the crappiest captain World Rugby has ever seen. Um, and a year later, you you know you go on and, and beat England in the final of a World Cup. <laughs> wasn't, who wasn't who great. invited it wasn't this final. guy? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think Ireland... way to win an audience, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think Ireland would look to do something in 2023. They're coming up in a pool where some of the opposition have all lost to Japan, um, Scotland, Ireland, South Africa in one pool um, in World Cups. But yeah, I think there's opportunity there. I think Faz is definitely doing something good. And I think with that experience, every team that wins a World Cup has actually got an incredible amount of experience. I mean, 2003, it was average age of 28, 29. Um, World Cup 7 for, uh, 7 for us was also 29, 30. 15? Are you sorry, you guys? <laughs> I'm joking. He's not only oh, in not not the audience, he's into the guests as well. <laughs> I was looking at that light and I just blanked out for a moment. I don't know what you said. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I think the, the experience definitely tells. And again, it's, it's difficult to say two years out. You know, there's this sort of a rolling momentum that one would hope they can gather, but they now go off playing that top echelon to a lower rated team tomorrow um, on Sunday. So I don't know. The, the one thing they do have in their advantage is they manage their players very well. Yeah. It's not like England where you finish Six Nations and you're straight back, you're playing Exeter away, Newcastle away, you're straight back in, your club wants their pound of flesh. They Because naturally, but in Ireland, essentially contracted, Johnny Sexton won't go play for Leinster until a big European game. Mm. So in terms of managing their players and keeping their players on the field, they could be genuine contenders in terms of the team we saw at the weekend that could be playing. And I like, I'm, I'm only assuming this, but Andy Farrell's still picking Johnny Sexton with his lovely grey hair, 100 tests. Like he's obviously saying, lovely. I believe that you're going to be there in the Rugby World Cup in, in 18 months time. Same as Joe Marler with England. Otherwise Eddie would just play younger players. So I think, I don't, I don't know this, but Andy Farrell's picking or working on a side to peak for that World Cup. He might not be interested in developing young players. His job, ultimately, is to what? Win a World Cup. Mm -hmm. Unless he's been employed to develop players. But that's David Nisifora's job, though, in Ireland, in terms of managing the structures and who plays for who. So, I mean... That's good knowledge. How do you know that? Do you not to know he's like the director of rugby for... <laughs> well, I do now, and so do all these people. Because you guys are lying, you didn't know that. <laughs> <coughs> the, dif the difficulty that Ireland have, though, is if they do get injuries. It's always still the same. Strength and depth. Because <coughs> if they don't, if it, you know, you saw it in 2015 when they lost, they lost Paulie O'Connell. Obviously, they lost yeah. Sexton, they, and they go into that that quarterfinal and get smashed. So they still have to have that in the back of their mind because they need to make sure that that the 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 the, guy, the 30 players that they have can all do a job, and that that's got to be one of their areas that they've got to focus on. But at the moment, they've got to get they've got to be winning first. Winning, and then the fact that they've never got to a semi-final of Rugby World Cup, yep. that they now all of a sudden have to, you know, beating the All Blacks is one thing. In the high-pressure situations, you have to do it f at least five times in a row. Um, sort of, there's three pool games that, you know, you can have to get through, but there's three then in a row on the bounce, and I think the pressure has been come quarter-final time. Yeah. They haven't been able to pass, and there's no one in this group 
of this island that has really done that. So how do they balance that, that situation, which I think is going to be tough. But when you've got experience, that hopefully brings a calmness to them. Nothing is impossible. Bask in the glory, Ireland fans, of a third win in, against New Zealand in five games. Not many get the chance to do that. So well done, Ireland. South Africa, how, how many, what, what out of 10 for the win over Scotland? I'd say six. They're wow. still not firing at all cylinders, to be honest. I think they, the dominance they had for the first 20 minutes to have not got a lot further was, I think, disappointing for them. Yeah, so I'd say six out of 10. I thought Eben Etzebeth was phenomenal. Yeah. I think Sia Khaleesi has been playing incredible rugby throughout the course of this year. And I was also surprised to see the Springboks go wide off turnover ball and score two tries. Um, it was as surprising for me as the rest of the world. But it was brilliant that's to delightful see. delightful for you? Delightful. Yeah. Um, again, I think that's also, you know, a lot of people potentially don't give Vili LaRue a lot of credit. He's, he has maybe been struggling for form, but again, coming in at first receiver on turnover ball to get it wide, to then have Makazoli Mapimpi um, become a South African winger who scores against every country that he has played against, which doesn't say much about my career. <laughs> <laughs> you, can't yeah. have, you can't have left many out there. Yeah, no, quite a few. I worked it out when I got asked the question. Tonga, Fiji, Japan. Um, he lost against Italy. <laughs> <laughs> which you never did. <laughs> I'll give you that. Yeah, 15, yeah, I'm, 14. I'm, I think it, it literally makes Saturday's game against England uh, a top-notch one because they both come in, you know, having won Two, two on the bounce, and I don't think there's a revenge element. Everyone's talking about revenge of 2019. Yeah, it is so long past that. Is you know this group of England would want to reflect on yes, and they might still be hurting, but it's not about revenge for me. I think as professional athletes, there is a bitterness potentially, but you want to you, you move on. I mean, two years ago seems like ten years ago, so I think it, it's tees up for an absolutely astounding game and two big injury losses for the English, which. Yeah. Well, hopefully could also in. be great not having Farrell. Uh, you know, realistically, if we want to look going should, forward... Should we phrase it as an opportunity rather than great? <laughs> well, no. it, it's an opportunity for others, Michael. I'm well, not having a pop at Faz. I'm just saying, look, we all talked about last week about how much movement there was around the team. If anyone watched how many times the bat line started, up in, started off in different positions through that game, you know, Henry Slade played most of it at fullback, Stuart on the wing, you know, Mano ended up playing centre most of the game off starter plays. And, and you just like, well, It'd be quite nice to not have to do that and actually let people play in their positions and actually uh, feel, you know, like normal. Uh, it, it does sound weird, but it is strange playing out position. It is strange if you play in a different position off every single move. Yes, you can move people around, but you want a home. I, I just think it gives an opportunity to keep Mano in the centres, play Slade, play Marcus Smith, let him just... It would be great to see him playing with... Do, like Don Brun again in terms of uh, giving him that safety net as obviously there's going to be a lot of pressure coming his way we're going to need him to play at that line I think if you watch the Scotland game Finn Russell got to the line and constantly you see Am and Delandy go past him he just needs someone there and you know you think of Finn Russell when he was in the Lions and those where he changed his mind at the line put those kicks across he I, he can scare play people, Marcus Smith, playing that close to the line. And if we can get those runners right, I think we can cause problems. So it'd be quite nice to just... And you saw Freddie Stewart's line when he, did, when he does do that. If you can pick those, I think we can, we can cause South Africa problems. But we've still got to... You've got to win every contact to make the ball fast and then play at a tempo where they can't dictate with their line speed. You were on the telly box at Twickenham. What did you what did you make of what England were trying to do? Do you do you mind that the shuffling of the back line in the way that Tins is alluding to? Or do you quite I mean, like a little bit of hocus pocus? To, to provide like probably I don't I didn't play in the backs, obviously. Did you not? I don't know anything about the backs, but the only people that didn't know who was home or, or where they were was us, I suppose. But you can remember they trained all week like that. And if I've seen one thing from the back line play at the minute, the ball's never going through the fly half, the traditional first five's hands on a launch play. It's hitting Alice Genge, Tom Curry, Owen Farrell, Manu Tulangi as a winger, launching them into that kind of 10 12 channel. And guess who's touching the ball second phase? Marcus Smith, the, the fly half. So I think the theme in the game at the moment is to use those strike runners like Manu running as a 12, but off the wing, to tie in a 10-12 and then get them on the jump next phase. And that's what England were doing. So Owen, there's all this talk about Marcus playing fly half. Owen touched the ball 
he, he had his hands on the ball first from Ben Youngs every time during that game. But he was the decision maker whether to hit the forward coming hard and straight flat or pulling it out the back to give Marcus Smith that time to make that decision making whether to hit Stewart on that line or, or play through the hands. So I, I just think the theme in the game at the moment, what they're trying to achieve, I could see it. Is that going to work against South Africa? I don't know. <laughs> Sit on the fence. Insightful. Have a guess. But... No, honestly, it's like playing people out of position. I think it's playing people to their strengths. To, to beat Australia, that was how they saw to win that game. And that team will be different this week, no doubt. Did you see anything from England to make you think, oh, hang on a minute? Or do you still think the muscle and the physicality that South Africa brings gives them a significant advantage? I do think the muscle, the physicality, but more importantly, the finishers, as England like to call them, that are coming off the bench and hard to resist that for 80 minutes. So being able to keep up that tempo, that physicality, that intensity for the full 80 minutes, continue Luke Anyam or da Damon Dalendi pushing guys back in, handling that you know, from a breakdown contest perspective. I mean, the likes of a Quacha Smith, a Dwayne Vermeer, and they are the worst Marks. people. <laughs> Malcolm Marks, yeah. Bongi Manami, they are the worst. If they're on the ball, you struggle to get. Eben was brilliant at it last weekend as well. So it's the constant hammering, battering physicality for 80 minutes that teams struggle with. Um, and when you bring on a, a brand new world-class front row two minutes before the end of the first half, that then goes before oh. that, that yeah, it goes for another 40. It's, it's insane. So we saw Finn Russell it really find a few chinks in the armor in that last Lions test match, yeah. which they really struggled with. I think Finn you know, took the ball really flat, found holes, got players running off it at Lions where that rush defense couldn't get there. So if someone like Marcus Smith can out the back in the bounce, you know, have players running off, potentially float one or two over the top, there is potential, but it's handling the physicality of brute force for 80 minutes, which all teams find tough. Brian's not worried about England. Are you worried about South Africa? Yeah, because they are the best at what they do. And even though I might say it's not, it's not great to watch, um, it's unbelievably effective and you have to give them respect for that. Uh, you know, they played like when I was abusing Highland, they, they, they play like that, but they are the best in the world at it and they've proved it by winning World Cups by playing that. Um, I just think, I just like to see their, their world-class players getting the ball a bit more in open space, which was good to see on the weekend that they did sort of buy into that a bit more because I do believe they don't just need to stick to that. I think if, you've got a, if you're going in a bad game, you can always go back to that, but I'd always like to see them chance their arm every now and again because they know that... Because even when they do make mistakes, they have this swarming... They create chaos incredibly well. And they seem to thrive at breakdown time within that chaos because people can't get their clear outs on right and they've got these guys that are so good at dropping over ball. Um, I would just like to see more. They, their back score a lot of tries, but most of them off dropped kicks from the opposition, which I'd quite like to see them from a lovely first phase strike move or I something. For the purist. Diolande to Mapimpi at the weekend. How good is Diolande? Yeah, he, no, played, he played it very, very well at the weekend. Team of the week he was. Yeah, he was. he's been playing well for the last three years, though. I just think yeah. you talk about England having, you know, the minor two leggies, the, the Owen Farrells. Mike Tindall's, yeah. No, I'm talking recent. Oh, okay. we're, not, we're not going back into the, <laughs> to the columnists of, uh, of <laughs> yesterday. You know, um, you know Damon's just been one of those guys from a go forward perspective like he's your man to go to he's um, unbelievable at the breakdown he causes as much as Dwayne Vermeulen Malcolm Marks all these Quacker Smith cause chaos in terms of getting on the ball Damien's if, if you watch as a rugby enthusiast watch Damien's work at a breakdown constantly fighting that extra yard on attack and defense putting the defense and attack under so much more pressure and I think his combination with Lucanio M has been flourishing for the better part of the last you know, three and a half years which is brilliant to see he's one of the best passes of the ball the pass to Makazoli was not as as idealistic as I'd loved it to be and again Makazoli you know finishing off superbly so yeah I love Damien I think he is the most calm, chilled out guy. Um, I mean, I think, is Damien actually in the pub tonight? Damien, <laughs> where are you? Um, but he's a, he's a brilliant bloke as well. Unbelievable, unbelievable player. It's interesting you say that you don't think Eddie Jones will reference 2019, because I, you read little bits and bobs, and actually we're going to talk about the stress test, which I think was designed to sort of just try and throw players and try and find little angles for them to try and work on. I'm going to ask you a question, you can hit it for six if you like. If there are whispers, which there are one or two, that Eddie is going to just try something on Saturday. Is that a thing? I mean, were you part of an, England, uh, an Eddie Jones team where he just said, right, this week we are going to 
try something totally unorthodox? Or is that not the way to take on South Africa? Well, I don't know what you're referencing. As, as he said, he's going to do something. Just little whispers that he's been targeting this game of the three and he is, he's got something that they've been working on, which we will see this weekend. And I just wonder if, if 2019 was the World Cup and whatever he threw at them went horribly wrong, can you think of what he might try this weekend? How do you beat this South African side, essentially? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think you've got to play. I think the game, the trend in the game has changed in the last 18 months, maybe. You know, South Africa win the Rugby World Cup. They won the Lions Series Rugby Championship playing a certain style of rugby. You know, kick, territory, big defensive physicality, what you talked about. And then when errors are forced, turn over ball, take their opportunities, play good, just heads up rugby. Yeah. Catch, pass, catch, pass, score, you know? But then Australia go and beat them by playing, by being at them, by, you know, if anyone's a Harlequins fan here, they play just heads up rugby, yeah. not too scripted, not too predictable. Australia do that very well. All Blacks have always done that pretty well. So I think that the sort of theme in, in world rugby now is to attack more. And I think uh, South Africa being beaten that way, probably then realized, shit, we can't just keep doing what we're doing. We've got to evolve. And the fact that you're saying at the weekend, they're starting to play a bit more. So this game that we go into the weekend will be built around physicality, built around set piece, but you've got to score fucking tries. You can't sit. And remember when we're all frustrated about England winning games for about like kicking down the field and defending, and we're all sitting there going, this is shit to watch, but England are winning. Like that was the theme at the time that was working, but then world rugby get involved. Everyone complains. Referees are going to start quickening the game up, make it more attractive. We need kids to play the game. Right now, the game's about attacking. That's why Marcus Smith is so hot right now. You know, it's about playing. It's about playing. And I genuinely think like, if, if you go behind on the scoreboard and you're playing a defensive kicking game and you're waiting for an opportunity to come through defensive pressure, you're not going to win a game. You've got to attack. You've got to go at teams. So I think, I hope, we're going to see more ball in hand this weekend built around that physicality, set-piece stuff. You can't just kick and, and wait for, for an error to happen, basically. You've got to go and, and play. I don't know. That's just my take on the game right now. I love yeah. it. And I, 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 think, I think you're bang question. on. No, you did answer the question. The question is, how do you beat South Africa? And if England are trying something, what is it going to be? Well, they can't try and match South Africa at what they do best. Yeah. You can't try and outscrum them, even though we're England and we love that. But we've got to play to our strengths. And uh, I look at the strengths of our team right now. It's probably pound for pound smaller than South Africa. But can play. We, we saw glimpses of what they're trying to achieve at the weekend. I think the hardest thing is, though, South Africa turn up here like an old war horse. They are... Uh, oh, we love it. You love that? <laughs> oh, we love, we love coming to Twickenham. No, no, but you, you, you are. Like, you're a gelled team. You've had a rugby, yeah. Alliance yeah. Series rugby championship, and now you're on tour. Like, they've got scars. They know how to win games. They can play six out of ten by Brian Habana's um, ratings and still beat Scotland 30 points 15. England have been together two weeks. A whole lot of kids kind of been blooded in that time. They, uh, yeah, they got through that Australia game, which is great, but they're coming up against a proper test this weekend. So it's a good mark from an England point of view of where we're at because we're playing against the best, the winners of everything at the minute. Love so, it. Love yeah, it. That's where we're at. Yeah, I, look, I think you've got these young kids in for a reason. You've, you've got to, you found out how you can lose to South Africa in a World Cup final. You've got to find out how you win. That means trying stuff. At the moment, as I said before, look at Australia, high tempo, high fast, high fast paced ball. I also think you don't, you can't give penalties away. Oh, necessarily, South Africa don't really create that much if you let them have the ball. So you can't give penalties away because if you give them field position, that's when they get into their rhythm, the juggernaut starts moving and you're in all sorts of trouble. If you're exiting, I wouldn't box kick. I would just smash it as long as I can, keep it in the field. Like the first game of the Lions, even though they were, getting, they were under pressure in that first half and having to take big hits, they kept the ball on the field and whether it was because they hadn't played in a while, they got tired. So I would keep just smash it long, make them have to return because the worst case is you, you might have a ball up on the halfway line. That you, if they do recover it, they're still on the halfway line rather than just outside your 22, which if you box kick, that's probably what's going to happen. So I think if you can play smart that way and get the offloading game that they had against Australia, but be a little bit more clinical with the last one by not forcing it um, and keep the ball up in the air, then you've got a chance. Not much really, basically. That you, you know, <laughs> Sounds you've got simple. to rewrite your whole game. But yeah. Hit me. Just on the revenge thing, like 
they will not be talking about that. If you look at the team from 2019 to now, completely different. Like, why would Freddie Stewart carry that baggage of a game sure. he didn't play in? He's probably getting his GCSEs or something, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's... It's, it's only us out here in terms of, when I say us, media that control the narrative, I suppose, trying to hype this up to something that it's not. Yes, the best in the world are in town. Yes, we're excited about this England team, but it's not revenge. The team will not be talking about revenge because if you look, 50% of the team Will any of the team, of the team have doubts off the back of 2019? Well, 50% of them won't because that's, okay, that's the best thing. Jamie George, Marrow, youth. Tom Curry, Sam Underhill, Ben Youngs, Manu... Henry Slade in the squad. Have, I don't think they'll have. I think they'll they'll have. They, no, I, I don't. I don't think they will. I think they'll just have a little burning thing. If we got, we could have. We let ourselves down. We can do it better. I don't. Think but they, experience is a good teacher. You yeah. know what I mean? They, they know the level. They know what's coming, which is great. And I suppose the other thing, if you don't have experience, you have got youth and exuberance, and you don't give a fuck. So, <laughs> like, if you're a young kid, just go out there and go balls out. Like, go for it. Cool. Oh, those that were involved in 2019 just go to the fact that no team has beaten New Zealand in the knockouts of Rugby World Cup and won their next game because that hasn't happened to anyone that does that. Another uh, trivia stat. No, you're wrong. Australia, 91. Oh. Semi-final, won the I'm final. Pro era. Oh, right. Sorry. <laughs> You've got a... F you South, got a South, South Africa weren't there. there. You've got a fucking answer for everything you have. <laughs> um, damn. Well then. I, I want to talk Rassi, and I want to talk yes. Billy, Mako, etc. as well, and just get your views on that. I do want to talk about the stress test, though, because it is really interesting that Eddie is trying just to do little different things to test him. Did you all watch the video earlier? Yeah. So just for the benefit of our viewers and our listeners, um, today, being Wednesday, if you listen to this on time, uh, Red Bull are releasing the stress test, which is a fantastic challenge that they put the England team through on a beach in Jersey ahead of their, um, their Autumn Nation Series training camp. Uh, what it involved was a, a tug of war, essentially, against an eight and a half ton Dakar rally legend capable of 1,150 brake horsepower, which is like your sort of your runaround, isn't it? It's your little weekend car. And I thought, it's a glamorous truck capable of racing over mountain dunes and cavernous ravines, and the England team go up against it. The thing that really leaps out is as it rolls into vision, this enormous eight and a half ton Dakar rally legend, Owen Farrell just stands there and says, nobody fucking move, nobody fucking move. And it's like a tank rolling towards, which is obviously a mindset thing from an England point of view. But I, you do watch that and you just think, what fun. I'd love, to, I'd love to have had challenges like that as a... No, you don't. Right. What are you thinking as you watch that? All he's thinking is he'd be at the back of the tug of war, you know, yeah. the weight at the back, the anchor, the anchor. All right, fattest. <laughs> Bullying that, Mike. We're not Sorry. in a rugby changing room anymore. This is the real world. <laughs> We've gone HR... i slimmed down, everyone. <laughs> Stronger and fitter now than when I played. We've we gone HR we, department as well. You can make a complaint we, we don't have an HR department. At, no, no, no. The rugby. Exactly. I am the HR department. <laughs> um, it's very cool content. I'd l I mean, it looks fantastic, which is what you'd expect with Robert. I'd love to know what you, what you think when you watch it, though. I, I, I'll tell you what, that, that environment... And, and very much to Eddie's recent media thing about changing staff, getting through, you know, it's all about keeping things fresh in that environment because otherwise you turn up to the same hotel, you go through the same meetings, it all becomes a bit stagnant. So just being creative in terms of... Um, getting the lads, the, the boys together and, and having a common purpose, I think. And I'll tell you what, like, during the start, or during my whole career, like, pre-season training, I reckon at the start was the best pre-season I did because there was no sports science involved. This is back in 20, 2004, 2005 when I first started. There was no sports science. Like, the tight heads ran as far as the wingers. Everyone did the same shit. But you got this really good team bonding. And when you're in the... 79th minute. I was never actually on in the 79th minute, but <laughs> you'd been but, sent off. But by we, then. When, it, when it's a bit dark on the field, <laughs> sorry, replaced, replaced. Yeah, it's a 23 man game now. Yeah. Can I tell my story? Permanently replaced with yeah. no replacement. <laughs> yeah. Made it fucking interesting though, didn't it? <laughs> Sports too vanilla now. Uh, no, but what, what I'm saying is when, when you're in the on the field. Um, and, and, and it's tough and you're defending your line and you've been through that sort of hard kind of military-based training. You, you guys would have done it as well. You can look at the people either side of you and you know that we've done harder than this, like we can get through this. Whereas you go out to pre-season now, the academy kid will say, how many reps are we doing? 
and be like, we're doing 10 sets of five, 60 meters. And, and it's, it's, you know, in a game, you're not being told when it's going to stop and how many you're going to doing. And I think that sort of character building element of that type of exercise is greater than the actual physical stress element of it. Yeah. Sorry, Red Bull. But it's the coming together, common purpose, working hard, bit of problem solving, get some sand in your jocks and a bit of chafing. And I, lo I love that. I think it's brilliant. I mean, you, you did some quite old school stuff with England. Didn't you? What did you do? Royal Marines stuff. And no, yeah, but it wasn't... Yeah, it was fun, though. Uh, we did... We, we, they, Clive got it right in the terms of you weren't, you weren't getting a flogging, you were doing something interesting. Uh, funnily enough... Um, I don't know, I've told, you, told this on the foot. So we did, there were three tests we did with the, uh, with the Marines. One was a sinking ship. So basically they have, the, they have this huge ship. Like 2011 ship. World Cup. <laughs> <laughs> with you at the helm. <laughs> and I was in the crow's nest. <laughs> Media ahoy! Run! Uh, <laughs> And <laughs> very good, Dylan. Well done. Um, yeah, uh, oh, yeah, so don't worry, got you a captaincy off the back of it. Um, <laughs> Learn from the best. <laughs> Experience is a good teacher. Yeah, yeah. Um, we we did so we did like three tests. One was a sinking ship, which which you had to you were basically in a in a fake ship, and you had to the it been like you'd been hit with a torpedo, and you had to fill all the holes. Basically, a test that you can't win. It's just see how good you can do at. There was a, a kitchen fire one um, where <laughs> Neil McCarthy, you you're basically on the end of a rope, and you've got to go try extinguish this kitchen fire. You can't see anything, full of smoke. He's let go of the rope, typical Gloucester man, uh, and they can't find the rope again. And all you can hear is he's walking around going. Stop! Stop! <laughs> Stop! I'm lost. So then someone in there finds it. And then we did one where you uh, you're in a fake helicopter crash. So you're in a big pool inside, and uh, you do you yeah, three shots. One is lights on, helicopter lands, sinks to practice how you go. So say there's eight of you sat in a row like that. The back guy has got the emergency exit. So he opens the exit, taps the guy on the shoulder, which means I'm going, then the next guy taps on the shoulder and you go in order and you know, you all know that you can hold your breath for 45 seconds, so you've just got to wait for your tap and then you, you know what you're doing. So, first one is, like, just lands normally, lights on. Second one lands, flips over, lights on. Third one <laughs> lands, flips over, lights off, pitch black, can't see anything. So you can't, there's no point opening your eyes in the pool, you still can't see anything. So Clive is at the front of this play, uh, of this chopper, right? So he's the last to get out. And he's done this. He's gone with the, the <coughs> he's gone with the, um, the Marines. Basically their job was to wheel what he called time, uh, energy sappers. So basically the only good thing that came out of it is it made sure it got rid of Austin Healy. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, but he was there to find out who wasn't prepared to sort of battle in and who'd stay, stay in there. So Clive's at the front seat, uh, so he's like ninth out. So we've all done the first two, all fine. Anyway, lights go off, drop, hit the water, turn over. You're waiting for that tap. Next thing you know, everyone is getting kicked in the face. You're like, what the fuck? What's going on? Literally getting kicked in the face. Then you feel the tap, so you turn and get out. You get out, they turn the lights on. Like, what, what went on there? I kept getting booted in the face. And the guy, they had a scuba guy die, down there with a, like a, an infrared camera on he goes guys you need to come and look at this so anyway we've gone over to the screen they've turned the, uh, they've got the video on so as soon as they hit the water flipped over in the dark Clive has just bolted down the back of the <laughs> down the back of the chopper booted everyone in the face on the way past and got out the back where, the, where you could always get out the back so if you got stuck you got out the back we're like right so yeah you're in there till the end are you Clive <laughs> brilliant <laughs> Leading from the back. Hey, save yourself! <laughs> <laughs> True team player. Unbelievable. Yeah. Did you quite enjoy those sort of challenges, though? I mean, did yeah, you enjoy were, what were, we're talking about here with, the, with you know, yeah, being there, there, were, in there were loads unusual. of good ones, like the old log run, and then down at Limston they have this mud run, which was, you had to do a mud run with a, uh, like a, like you were getting someone out of battle, which there was like 10 of you, and it was carnage, up to your way. But at the end of it, you get that real satisfying feeling that you've done it with the with the the 10 guys who you were carrying with hopefully you've won the challenge but no i i, I do enjoy things like that they, they give you a massive gratification as a team at, at the end of it as teamwork and everything else yeah just thinking about players and content we, we've obviously had very good content and you raced a cheetah i did talk to me about that now well, how on earth did that come about and 
It's one of the stupidest things I've ever done. It would not fly in today's... <laughs> no, it would not fly in today's professional era. So it was like on a Thursday before the Crusaders in a Super Rugby game. So what happened is... and. It, it literally got bro- blown out of proportion by the media guys. I, I refer to you as media now. <laughs> um, so we got this nature conservation uh, farm who sort of looks after endangered cheetahs and tries to sort of bring them back Sounds into... Sounds like a zoo. <laughs> <laughs> Is endangered too big a word for you? I thought, I thought you were good. But anyway, so they sort of contacted me and they said, listen, we really want to bring to light the plight that the cheetah is facing in terms of potentially becoming a endangered species. I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah, well, well, we got this idea, race against cheetahs. I was like, yeah, 2007, something like that hasn't been done yet. Like, sounds like fun, you know, a little 10 meter thing. So get to this nature reserve and sort of the woman takes us through and shows us this very patchy piece of grass. I'm like, okay, cool, this is amazing. She goes, um, oh yeah, so like, where am I gonna be running and where's the cheetah, what side of the fence? They go, well, okay, so we laid the grass like three weeks ago. I'm th- already thinking Heineken Mayer is shitting in his pants, thinking that I'm not race, doing something stupid. Thursday before the Crusaders. So, okay, well, three weeks ago, it's very patchy. Just make, you, make sure you warm up properly. Um, I'm like, which side of the fence is the cheetah racing on? She goes, no, you, you see this little string running down the middle? I'm like, yeah. She goes, no, you're going to be on the one side and the cheetah's going to be on the other side. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, whoa, there, there was no indemnity sign anyway. I'm like, okay, cool. I was just, not to bring any attention, but what is the like, protocol if the cheetah looks up at a very fluffy bunny, which is cute, but it's not quite my rump? Like, what is the protocol? She goes, oh no, you'll, you'll be fine. I'm like, no, no, what is the protocol? No, we have one ranger on this 110 meter track. I'm like, one ranger? You know, he's, he's got a tranquilizer gun. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> she dropped it like a boat. A tranquilizer, like, how good is this guy's shot? Like, I'm a moving target with a smaller moving target next to me. Um, no, it was, so it was absolute and bananas. So I'm sort of standing there looking 30 meters back. And for those of you that have experienced wildcats in the savannah in Africa, you shit scared. Like, you see this thing, and like, it locks its eyes on you. And you're like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then I'm thinking, then I like ask, at what point do I start running? And they're like, no, we, so we had some of the guys on the farm, like just testing it out, and they started running at like when the cheetah got to like, I'm like, how fast are these guys? No, maybe about half your speed. I'm like, <laughs> so at what point do, you, do I actually then so, go? So this wasn't out of the blocks. This was like rolling start. No, so I, no, he, no, we were both standing still, but it was 30 meters behind me. So, so. so it was okay. at 110, I was at about 80, and then it gets led out, and it only chases the lure that's in front of it. So yeah. that little r- r- nice, fuzzy What did it tell you that that was you? <laughs> <laughs> like, so I'm like, uh, we, we've got this little lure, but actually we've just up fed him for a while, no, so he's actually going for meat. No, then, did, I can't, did you win? I can't remember. So the whole thing was around, actually, the you can't so potentially no. beat. No, no, no. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I did win. So I did actually win, and that's like the whole theme was for the cheetah sort of cross me mid this massive grandstand of international media that I don't know. I mean, I don't know South Africa had that much money to have a big grandstand with international media, but the cheetah was supposed to cross me like at that point, and I was like, I don't have a fucking clue at what point this. I'm just running to my life here, yeah. um, <laughs> and then I get to the end, and the lady's like. Brian, we didn't actually get the photo of the cheetah crossing you in the middle of the grandstand. Can you do it again? I was like, fuck no. <laughs> you're crazy. No, no it was crazy. Amazing. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I don't think you would get away with someone like that now. Without naming names, can you think of the weirdest content you've been asked to be involved in? I mean, Hass would instantly go to his calendar of the gods. Can you think of anything off the top of your head where you're just like, how have I ended up in this? You've obviously given a very good example. If not, we'll move swiftly on. You must have had some quite curious kind of... I wasn't really commercially viable when I played. Um, <laughs> I probably lost more sponsors uh, over the years, and then I became untouchable. Uh, no one wanted to. You're fighting back now. Yeah, I'm back, baby. Way. I'm back. The rebuild. Um, I, talking about this weekend, I, I, I want to ask you about Rassi. Has it, he, he hasn't had the book thrown at him yet. Has there been any adjudication post the Lions? They ha- well, so there was an uh, official hearing. Two weeks ago, three weeks ago, there hasn't that been. One, that was one he asked to have televised. Yeah, the one he asked to have publicly televised, which World Rugby obviously said no to. So, from my understanding, I don't think an official statement has been released by World Rugby. From my understanding, I think Rassi's case is potentially very watertight because he didn't actually leak the video. From my understanding. So, what what do you make of the incident? I, what, do you make of, what do you make of all of that, first of all, before we talk about how long it's taken to sort it out? Yeah, I think 
the quicker whatever the resolution is comes out and we all can get over it and say, okay, well, accept it or deny it, but just to have a set statement. So I think World Rugby is trying to just get to a resolution as quickly as possible. The Lions series, unfortunately for me, potentially won't be remembered for the rugby, and it was a massive tit for tat. And for me, it actually all started when you know Warren Gatlin, you know, also didn't say anything specifically to the media, but said that how can Morris Yonko, who is a South African, be the TMO ahead of that first Test match, and sort of threw Morris under. And was like, well, how are we going to throw stones? So I think any international coach would have said that. By the way. Because I, d- I don't think it should be it shouldn't have happened. I, I know. They, I think they all knew I that that was the case. I knew. I knew. Obviously, uh, the COVID sets a precedent that maybe they couldn't have someone else, but they needed to come out and say that get ahead of it because every coach would have said that. All right. I think. I think. Brian. Every coach I've ever worked under would have made that point. Clive would have definitely made that. point. The point being that there was a South African yeah. TMO for a South Africa Lions Test match. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's difficult to say because COVID has, un- it's, it's not like World Rugby and it wasn't. So what actually happened, it, it sort of felt like it was a personal attack on Morris Jonker, which we had, or SA Rugby. And it had nothing to do with SA Rugby or Morris getting selected. So I think it all started at that point. It obviously went a lot further Then Yaku Johan, you know, came, came to the fore and, and the 62 minute video then came out, which put a damper on everything. You know, did it highlight a few things? I think as South Africans, it did highlight many things that a lot of people felt went wrong. and. Every decision on the rugby field can be scrutinized to the nth degree. We all know that. Like, if you literally had to stop play at every phase of play, you could make five different decisions, in, in my opinion, ruck, ruck time and everything. So, it unfortunately watered the series down. Um, I'm extremely proud, even despite that, of the resilience that the players showed. You know, having, I mean, Sia, I actually sort of bumped into him sideline, and it was the toughest week of his life. Mm-hmm. So, all of a sudden, as a captain, you know, you've got this media attention that's now been placed on you as a captain, on you as a team, um, and it, it was tough, and you could just see the amount of pressure and intensity that had been on these soldiers. And then for them, as players, to come through that, despite all that happened, ex- extremely proud. I, I definitely think, it unfortunately, you know, tarnished the series in a way. Um, and I don't say it had heralded Razi as a, as a hero in South Africa, but yeah, I think... It, it, sorry, it did herald him? Yeah, really? definitely, yeah. I think the, the manner in which he highlighted things um, is something that where someone feels, you know, we we had instances in 2011 Rugby World Cup where, uh, you know, right, yeah. us too. <laughs> <laughs> in the wrong way. So yeah, I, again, no, is it good for the game? Probably not. Um, did it highlight things that I think South Africa feel, you know, really hard done by? I definitely think so. And I think particularly, I think for me, with Sia and how Sia was handled in in that first Test match was was rather disappointing. And and as a captain, you can't really then come out and, and make a statement, you know, particularly post game. So Rassi took a hell of a responsibility on his shoulders to do something like that. I think to, again, no one knows how the video got leaked, um, whoever Yaku Johan is. Um, but yeah, he is a cult hero potentially now in South Africa. Interesting. What, what do you make of it at this point? Oh, is, is it time to move on? Yeah, it's or does it need to be to sorted on. out? I, it, it was ridiculous. And uh, I don't think it, there's a place for it, but it got leaked. It is what it is. I, th- I think referees have a, a, a massively... Uh, hard job in everything they do because for what Brian said, you know, every every person can view something differently. I said, you know, I said on a group that I could go through make a 62 minute video on the same game and probably pick out things where I could say, well, South Africa should have got penalised for that. So it's just it's just horses courses, and it was just whether it was two two egos of two coaches playing a, a battle that you know didn't really need to be and, and especially with the series as it was with no fans no cra- no people traveling you know it, the rugby had to stand up and it def- and it uh, which didn't do it in the second game for certain and then it, it just puts the focus back on the wrong things i thought okay it'd be interesting to see what happens we record on a monday so it'll be interesting to see what happens between eddie jones and rassi leading into saturday this week i want to ask you a quick question just about obviously mako at this point still hasn't been called in to the england squad billy isn't at the moment in eddie jones plans etc quite a few others who seemingly are are being moved on at this point as someone who's been through that i mean you had a great relationship with eddie i didn't get moved on i got injured then retired <laughs> right I, I get tied okay, in. No, 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 no. I'll tell that. you why. I'll tell you why there's this theme here that I was part of the cull That's of Chris Robshaw. That's a very James valid Haskell. point. Because James Haskell usually sits here and he says, yeah, me, John Hartley, we got cold. I got injured. That is a very valid point. I got injured. I did not get cold. That and I just couldn't point. make it back and I retired from the game. I retract so, re-emph- re- and rephrase I was going to get cold. Right. So... <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> 
so I retired. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so no, you I, said that, not me. Yeah. I, I just love to know. Do you, do you think it is? Do, do you think there is a way back for Mako and Billy at this point? And do you think there should be a way back, or do you think England are right to carry on as they are? Uh, oh, I'd say the doors never closed in Eddie's mind. You look at Sam Simmons. Where's Sam Simmons for four years? Been banging on about it. Sam Simmons sets up the last try of the weekend. You know what I mean? The, the doors never close. It depends on the personal relationship between those players and none of us know how their non-selection has gone down. Have they rung up? Has Billy rung up and said, that's cool, I'm going to get my head down, I'm going to work really hard, I'll be back in your plans for the World Cup. And has Mako rung up and gone, yeah, I don't care, mate, I'm going to go to France. Yeah. So it depends how that was left. And I'm sure, knowing both those guys, they've still got aspirations. They've got plenty of rugby left in their legs. Um, and I suppose there is speculation about them moving clubs. As soon as they do, I, I suppose, confirm that speculation about where they're playing their rugby next would give a pretty good indication of their international aspirations. So the other thing is, is like you've got Bevan Rod. I've got to get this right because I talk on TV. And Davison, first name? Trevor. Trevor. Plays for Newcastle. Correct. Yeah. Got yes. that right. Yes. I had to do my homework because I wasn't too sure. Because yeah. Alice Ginge, Joe Marlow, I do know. The two young <laughs> fellas, I don't know. Yeah. They weren't supposed to be playing, but they played and they went good. Yeah. Did a good job. What's the point in having them in the squad unless you're going to use them? So, in, in essence, I think Eddie's done the right thing. He's put his trust and empowered those younger players to go, go on, boys. Go out there. I believe in you. You've got good players around you. You're going to do a good job. So, that's why you've got a squad. And essentially, they'll be better off for that game against Australia because, you know, he knows what Mako can do. And I love Mako on his day, world-class prop. But he will never learn anything about Trevor Davison or, or Bevan Rod without playing them last weekend and potentially give them another shot this week. But did he, has he done that too late? Should he have done it in the Six Nations when they, were pl they weren't there, when no, they uh, were in the championship? Should he have done the young guys then? Potentially, but that's all captain hindsight, isn't it? Well, and if you think if we're building for 2023, which is his job, he'd probably rather get to know a bit about these guys. And if Billy and Mucko, or let's just talk about Mucko because we're talking about props, he knows what Mucko can do. He's got credit in the bank. If Mucko recreates that form, he's young enough to play in the Rugby World Cup in, in 18 months' time. He can't be young enough. He looks like he's 84. <laughs> yeah. Only 29. <laughs> It's a very good answer, it, genuinely. And I think, I think it'll be very, very interesting to see how they respond. It, it creates options for him. So if he brings Mako in, sends Bev Rod back yeah. to Sale. Yep. Yep. Good work again, knowing my stuff. You should um, be on telly. I uh, know. <laughs> um, if he sends him back to Sale without playing him, it's like, what does he learn? Use him now, learn. If they lose, hey ho, and Mako starts playing well, Mako come back. Or yeah. if Bevan goes really well, keep yeah. him there. You know, we, we learn something. Okay. Eddie learns something. Eddie we learns something. I still say we, I can't say that. Oh, you can. You can. Let's have a quick sort of look ahead to the weekend, though. I suppose we've got, we've got a couple of minutes. And I do also want to quickly ask you, because you've been doing a lot with the Red Roses as well. Let's do Red Roses first of all. If they win this weekend, they will equal the England men's record of 18 consecutive victories playing the US. Uh, have they ever been as good as they are right now? No, they, they are streets ahead. They played the world, you know, the, uh, we talk about the brand of the All Blacks, yeah. the, the Black Ferns in town. They, they were the team. They, they've just obliterated them two weeks in a row. I kind of thought the first game, you know, caught the, the Black Ferns napping. They haven't played in 18 months, two years. They turn up in Exeter, a little bit, you know, jet lagged or whatever it may be on the other side of the world on tour. Red Roses caught them, but then they backed it up at Franklin's Gardens the week before and put another record score on them. So the professionalism that's been instilled in that team now, the money, the funding, the infrastructure that's around those girls now, that they're, they're flying. And then they go play third in the world, Canada, who are the, the next kind of most physical challenge. And then they put 50 points past them as well. So the, the Prem 15s, the, the girls tournament, women's, sorry. I say lads and boys, so I can say girls. Yep. Um, the girls tournament, the domestic tournament is strong but the inf international setup is strong and it's putting pressure on all the other home nations. So Wales have just basically been bullied into giving their girls contracts, which yep. is great. Because the problem is their other sternest opposition is France. They get to play France all the time, but they need Ireland, Scotland and Wales to come to the party for it all to get better. So the girls are flying. Um, they should absolutely smash USA this weekend. Um, that's that's an educated opinion. That's not just been... 
they're, they're, they're flying. Yeah. yeah. And rightly so, which makes next year's Rugby World Cup in New Zealand a mega, mega event. I want to ask you just about this weekend, a final word on each. I'll come to you first of all. Are you, are you, do you feel pretty comfortable going into this weekend? Do you think it is South Africa's to lose, in inverted commas? No, I don't. I think it's, it makes for a brilliant weekend of rugby viewing uh, across the whole weekend, not just one game. I think, like Tin said, I think world rugby is in a good place in terms of a number of the top tier teams. You actually don't know, again, now, given what happened last weekend at the Viva, you know, and the youth and exuberance that it is in that French side, you know, can New Zealand maybe go back to back, potentially? Cause I think that's a great position for world rugby to be in. South Africa up against England, is it too tight to call? I think so. Um, call it. I'm obviously going to go to South Africa. Um, I think there's just too much in the tack. There we go. The, uh, drinks on you. Uh, yeah, there we go. Big no, they're, they're not South African friends. They could be English, Welsh, Irish, Kiwi, Aussie. It, anyone that wants to beat England. Italian. No, no. We've been through this. Italian. Italian. There we go. Thanks, Italian. Wow. Just killing me softly with your song, aren't you? Um, no, so I think it is a tough to call. I just think the box that the, the bench that comes on is, is just phenomenal. And, and few teams in world rugby have struggled to, to match that. So. I think it'll be a lot closer than people think. I think there's maybe two to three points in it, but I'm going to go two to three points for the men in green. Okay. Yeah, I, I, look, if I, if I went with my brain, I, I just think they're too slick, South Africa, at the moment. But I dream that we're going to play in a way that's going to lift the pace, take them out of their comfort zone. That is what you have to do, is not let them get into their juggernaut that they can play, where they just get into their rhythm, don't give away penalties. Now, if we can do that, we can we can upset the tempo. But it's a massive but. They are so good at doing what they do, whether you like it or not. They are the best in the world at it. They've won World Cups off the back of it when they're down. Uh, unless you can race ahead where you have to make them chase a game, then you're always under threat because when the bomb squad comes on, Penalties suddenly seem to flow their way and then possession comes their way and then you've got a juggernaut coming at you. But let's believe, because we are always English, we'll believe, uh, and, 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 and half Kiwi. Um, yeah, look, I just hope that we play at a tempo, we play at a thing, and if we do, we've got a chance. How big a day for Eddie Jones leading into 2023? Is it a game that he can afford to lose because he's trying something or is it a game he has to win because it reboots, resets, fills the sales for 18 months time. It just shows us where we're at. Okay. That answers your question. But I just want to add to, to that. We want to play with that tempo and that, but there's no shying away from the fundamentals of what South Africa are bringing. But you got to look at England. They, they pride themselves on physicality. You got Tom Curry, Sam Underhill, Mara Toje, big physical units, Courtney Laws, Joe Marler coming back in. Those boys can whack. So they'll be salivating at the prospect of this this weekend. My concern would be around the set piece, uh, Jamie George not being there, and what's to come on, the inexperience, I suppose, to come on in place of those guys. I think that experience, obviously, you, you've talked a lot about the bench, the, you know, the finishes when they come on. That is where South Africa is like strong. at off time. <laughs> Three minutes before the end of the yeah, first half. They, they know what to do. They know their role. That, that team knows what they've got to do to win. So, you look, it, it's going to be like... Tin says hopefully expansive but there's no shying away from the fundamentals of the game which is physicality and England can't just ignore that so they'll be concentrating on you know meeting that bone on bone uh, this week huge for England I, I've got to ask you as well France New Zealand quick prediction on that one I just can't see New Zealand going two weekends in a row and I just think there's too much class despite a change in the potential aura of the New Zealand psyche. I just, as, as amazing as this French side is, led impeccably well by probably the player of the year in my opinion. Anton Dupont has been phenomenal for club and country for the better part of the last three years and it's yeah. brilliant to see him leading that fora from the front. But I just think New Zealand would be absolutely hurting and they would not be liking it. So I'm going to go New Zealand by a few, seven. Okay. Yeah, I, th I think it's a humdinger. I think hopefully you'll just get uh, Entomac standing there, smiling at the, everyone, and everyone will be in awe of this beautiful man. And, <laughs> and the next thing you know, Dupont's made a break and they score. Um, I, I think they found, uh, with Jaminet at the back, I think they found another uh, golden nugget in terms of he just looks cool under pressure, knocks over his goals. Um, you know, Damien Pinot, I think they've got 
world-class players all over it. I think they can mix it up front. Interesting whether they play Waki at, um, uh, in the second row again or they put him back to his second row. I don't think he quite did what they wanted there. But they've got bangers, you know, Marchand up front, Bay up front. They can mix it with this. And if they, if they can get, again, they can take New Zealand out of the comfort zone. I, th- I think New Zealand are there for the taking, but... I think it's going to be a humdinger. I hope it's a humdinger at game. I hope it doesn't have the weather conditions that they had in the second half of Georgia and they're just allowed to go toe-to-toe because there are some great players on that pitch. Have, have they got another game after that? Are they playing Italy? Mm. <laughs> Don't they have a loss Well, they won't actually. go three in a row. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Or was that the first game? I think that's they've done. Well. No, they've played, they've they've played, played Italy well. already. Right. I've, played, I've been they've, paying attention. They've played, they played so Wales and Italy. Wales, yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, we haven't, we haven't spoken about Wales. Oh, they've got Australia two sides who desperately need a win last question um, yeah I mean I don't want to say Wales were lucky on the weekend but obviously you know they, they got run around a bit by the Fijians and uh, you know Australia are going to play that high tempo game again um, I think Wales are in a change of still in that change of style obviously they, they won the Six Nations uh, people say with the help of red cards I'd never go down that route um, but um, you know I think they're still trying to find their feet of what they are what they are I think they've got great players um, so I think it's going to be an interesting one I don't know when when was the last time Wales beat Australia have they had success they have against done Australia it the last four, four years ago I think they did right three years ago I, I think oh, the it, World Cup I think 2019 could, they did as I well. think it could be a uh, it could be a, a really good game and quite open game and because that's what sort of Australia bring is quite a loose game and I think Wales actually have players that could thrive on that especially with their, their back row as well if you look at the fixtures this weekend Italy Uruguay okay Scotland Japan England South Africa Wales Australia France New Zealand all on Saturday on Prime on Sunday it's Ireland against Argentina it is, it is tight at the top across the board now isn't it which, which is where we that, started the show tonight a good game Ireland Argentina yeah because I don't think Ireland have had that much success against Argentina. No, so a bit of a they, team. they take yeah, they take them out of their comfort zone. So Why has it suddenly got tighter at the top? I think COVID sort of potentially leveled the playing field for me. Uh, all of a sudden, you've all had to sort of come through certain things, and I think it has brought people and teams closer together. It has raised the mental resilience that players have had. I mean, we've never had to go through anything as unprecedented as, as this pandemic, and I think. Again, what Argentina managed to do in, you know, in Australia last year, beating, beating New Zealand for the first time ever. I think how Australia played in this, this year's rugby championship. So this mental resilience that this whole group of professional rugby players had to go through you know, has really just stepped up the intensity. Um, and they're now going to levels that haven't been seen before because they've had to overcome things that have never happened before, which I think is brilliant for the game. And you know, long may that continue. Man. It's, sh- it's shared with like, the younger, there's so many young young players out there like 20 to 24 years old who don't really have any fear and, and I, I think they've sort of risen in COVID because they don't worry about it. they don't sort of claim that they don't need the you know the crowns to give them all their, their their will to win I think they just they want to succeed and they want to go forward and they've got no fear and I think you see that now a lot of the times uh, especially in the, that Australia team in terms of how they've managed to turn a corner hopefully um, and yeah long may it continue because it makes for better watching I think it's tied at the top because if you look at the information share and what's available now to to coaches and players, everyone's doing the same thing. Like, if I looked at that Australian coaching staff at the weekend, I worked with three of them in our camp two years ago. Everyone's moving jobs. Everyone's taking themes. Michael Checker's coaching Australia, then he's coaching Argentina against Australia. I think the information share and the knowledge pool, and like everyone's doing the same thing. S and C, there's always a new trend in terms of strength and conditioning. One country might be. Everyone's looking for that edge because everyone's doing the same thing, and I think the gaps. It, for years, it was New Zealand leading the way, doing something. Everyone would be catching on, at, you know, 12 months later. Whereas now people are learning quicker and watching and analysing and actually trying to pioneer themselves and come up with new trends and themes. So everyone's looking for angles. And I just think that is why it's closer at the top. That's a very good point. You can actually, you can map a lot of people. You look at what's red- available stats-wise and analysis and GPS and the the vision in, in terms of... An, well, I don't know what I'm saying. No, you do. Uh, and, no. I'm, and I'm two years out of the game, but I'm saying when I do my TV stuff at the weekend, and you know this, right? 
The amount of information we get sent through on every team and every player, I don't read it. It's like the Bible. I don't read that either. It is. Um, it is. Tw- it is 27 Sorry, pages. Anyway. At least 27 but pages. I'm just saying the information available now on teams is ridiculous. You can pick up themes. You can tell what sh- what play, how much they kick, how many kicks you're going to receive a game, how many lineouts you're going to get a game, how what players carry with the ball, how many times they pass. So you know if Malcolm Marx is going to get the ball, he's not going to pass. He might pass one or two out of ten. You know what I mean? I've just made that and up. Then, and then Chazen scores in a Rugby World Cup final. Oh, <laughs> Jesus Sorry. Christ. <laughs> I mean, Saffers, they're good at rugby, but yeah, the banter yeah. is yeah, shit yeah. ass. <laughs> I mean, fashion and banter. Uh, and on that bombshell, there is no right to reply. I Dylan, mean, where did that you come win. From? I wasn't even. I was. Uh, that just came from nowhere. You looked directly into my eyes and said, "Malcolm Marx is not going to pass." I was the looking ball. for like a nod of affirmation. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dylan, you're right. You're talking good shit here. <laughs> uh, but it's just you're talking good shit here. That is for sure. Guys, it's been really. Do you know it's been really nice to talk rugby, hasn't it? Tonight we never ever do that with Hask and Jack Noll last week. Not to have Hask. Yeah, it's I mean, lovely. I mean, a- everyone in the room hasn't passed out because all the oxygen has disappeared. <laughs> you know, carbon dioxide everywhere. It's just so good. We no, love the boy. He doesn't no bring a lot of detail. Tef. What were you going to say? You're going to knife Hask. Oh, no, he's one, 100%. He is available. Yeah. Good to bad the rugby. We should do this. Dylan actually often. said he wants to do the stress, stress test. You did. Do you want to do the stress yeah, test? Yeah, yeah. My, my trousers on the stress <laughs> test right now. Um, I was just thinking though, if we did go good, you're obviously the rugby. No, he's the, not, I'm no, the good. He's the he's rugby. The good. Oh, I'm the, rugby. I'm the angel. Yeah, but I'm not. I yeah, can't th- be that. This is no. this, this is where it so fell we've down done this the before. first day. If you join us, it'll be the good. Hask is the bad. You'll be the baddest, and Tins will be the rugby. Ooh. And what about Brian? Brian on tonight's performance isn't getting in the squad. <laughs> Oh, fuck. How many cheaters have you beaten? How many? You can buy the South African Bowling franchise and do what you like with it. Yeah, we do yeah, need guests, so yeah. it's, it's good. Yeah. It's good. Guys, it's been a lot of fun. Just before we go, we have to do our traditional spiz section, which stands for shit biz. Hask is, is very proud of this section. We've got another poker tournament coming up on Monday the 22nd of November with Party Poker, which we're very much looking forward to. You cleaned up last time. Well, I mean, Hask got knocked out first hand and someone won a PlayStation, yeah. which was very good. Uh, Tin stayed into about 35th out of 150, which was yeah. which was good. And I got knocked out at 29th, and I won nothing. So I should have just got knocked out <laughs> fucking early and gone home. Gone home, yeah. But no, great, great event. Monday, 22nd November, if you fancy coming to play poker, it's got a five grand prize pool. So they actually have to take me out this time. Yeah, so Tins, who's got a bit more substance to his poker, is the man to take out, and you win VIP tickets to our tour next spring. Uh, if you want to get involved in that, head over to our socials for the details. And remember, to take part, you've got to be over 18. Please play responsibly, unlike Hask. T's and C's may apply. Uh, and if you haven't listened to our Scaz pod this week, Good Scaz and Rugby, we've got the England head coach Simon Middleton on as well, just basically revealing the secrets that you have been alluding to. What a nice man he is as well. Great man. Yeah. Doing great things yeah. as well. Um, unlike us, unfortunately. Ladies and gents, that is it as far as our live pod recording is concerned. We are the good, the bad, and the rugby! You are the beautiful people in the Prince here in Fulham, which, thanks to Red Bull, has been transformed into the best seat in the house to watch the Autumn Internationals this year. A huge thank you to Dylan and to Brian. Can we have a massive cheer for these two? Thank you. <laughs> Gents, you're brilliant. Very, very good indeed. We'd love to do more bits. Normal service resumes for us next week. We'll be back in our normal digs. Until then, look after yourselves. Enjoy a belting, belting weekend of rugby. Thank you for joining us. One big cheer to say goodnight. Love and hugs to you all. Good night, and thank you for listening. <laughs> Woohoo!